Hey guys, my name's Kim. Welcome back to my channel. Today we are doing something a little bit different on my channel. First of all, I'm not wearing any makeup yet because we are doing a get ready with me. Similar to the style of Bailey Sarian, but I'm not doing a true crime video today. Recently, I've been watching a ton of Sydney Black, who I freaking love. And she has a similar series called Makeup and Mindset, where she talks about other topics that aren't necessarily true crime while she does her makeup. And I was really inspired by that concept because I do like true crime, but I'm also really interested in things like history and random oddities around the world. So I didn't really want to be limited to just true crime. As you would have seen from the video title, today's video is on Tutankhamen. I'm going to get started doing my makeup and we will talk about the story of King Tut. Also FYI, I'm not going to be talking about the products I'm using while I'm doing this, but I will leave the products in the description box if you are interested. The reason I wanted to talk about King Tut is because recently I've seen a lot of people saying that they think all the craziness going on in 2020 is somehow linked to the curse of the pharaohs or King Tut's curse. And I was kind of like, okay, that's a bit random. <laughs> I know 2020 is crazy, but is it because of a pharaoh's curse? I don't think so, but I'm going to look into it. Put on way too much foundation, oh my god. But King Tut's story is actually pretty interesting and also just fair warning that there are a lot of Egyptian names in this video that I will find hard to pronounce. So apologies for pronouncing names badly in my Australian accent. In advance apologies so king tut is well known as being the most famous pharaoh of all time wow i look so crazy on camera <laughs> i did apply way too much foundation oh, it's because i'm used to using my sharpness a sponge that soaks up a lot of product and i just switched to the juno and co sponges that don't soak up any product so i've just applied like a literal crazy amount of product holy shit i look nuts <laughs> don't worry we're gonna fix this i look completely nut bags at the moment so I thought it'd be interesting to look into his history and to why people are still relating modern day events to his curse. King Tut was born in the 1300s BC. His parents were the pharaoh at the time, whose name was Akhenaten and Akhenaten's sister. And yes, you heard that right, sister, and that will come up later. But it is important to note that a lot of people think that Akhenaten was his father, but, but that is also widely disputed, so they think it might not have been his father. But for the sake of this video, we are going with the premise that Akhenaten was Tutankhamun's father. And also, I just want to give a quick disclaimer. I'm no Egyptologist, obviously. Everything I say might not be perfect, so I advise you to do your own research if you're curious about things, because in Tutankhamun's lineage and his history, there's a lot of things that are up for debate and that are widely disputed. So I've just compiled the information I could find on the internet and what seemed to be the general consensus a lot of the time. So if anything is wrong, I apologize. So Akhenaten, Tut's father, had actually been married to Queen Nefertiti. Nefertiti is one of the other most well-known Egyptian figures, but she actually wasn't his mother. She was his stepmother, although that's also disputed some people do think that Nefertiti was his mother, but like I said for this video, we're not going with that premise. It is believed that Nefertiti was his stepmother and that his mother was actually his father's sister. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about Nefertiti much here, but she was a very important part of Akhenaten's rule. And he ruled for about 17 years before he died. And the most significant thing that Akhenaten did during his rule was force a major religious revolution in Egypt at the time. The reason I want to talk about this is because it does come to play in Tutankhamun's rule. So before that point, Egypt very much practiced polytheism, which is the worship of multiple gods or goddesses. And the major change that Akhenaten brought in was that he wanted his people to worship one god, which was the sun god Aten. So he was forcing a people that were used to worshipping many gods to a more monotheistic religion. And I don't know about you, but how well do you think that went over? <laughs> he did go about destroying a lot of monuments for their original deities and, you know, just destroying a lot of stuff 
it's pretty questionable. The reason why this was especially such an unpopular move in Egypt is because the main cornerstone of Egyptian religion at the time is the belief in the afterlife. When you die, there's not just nothingness, there is very much an afterlife. And that is seen as a continuation of your life, which is why they had mummies and tombs in the first place, because often in their tombs, they would put a lot of their personal belongings, they would put food, all kinds of things in there, everyday objects, because they saw that as the continuation of their life. Death wasn't the end. Afterlife was a very important aspect of their religion. And unfortunately, worshipping the sun god didn't have such a concept as the afterlife. As far as the new cult of Aten was concerned, death was kind of the end and you just kind of rested after that. And you can imagine that was very disconcerting. The average Egyptian person who is living their life thinking, death isn't the end. Even if my life is hard now, I will continue to live in the afterlife. I think humans very much struggle a lot with the concept of death. And if you go from telling people there is an afterlife, this is not the end, to replacing that religion and then telling people that is the end, you just die and that's it. It's quite a tough pill to swallow so I can see how that move was very much not that popular with the general populace of Egypt at the time. So that's the main thing that Tut's father was doing during his rule. And then he fast forward several years to when Tut was nine years old and his father dies. Akhenaten was thought to have died from some kind of plague or illness sweeping Egypt at the time. He died quite suddenly and it's kind of debated again whether there was a couple rulers who took over the leadership role for a little bit before Tut or if Tut just ascended the throne straight after his father died. But in any case, not long after that, Tut ascended the throne at the young, young age of about nine years old. He was truly the boy king. So Tutankhamun only ruled for about nine years. He died when he was about 19 to 20 years old. But during his nine years of rule, the main thing he did was to try and undo the religious revolution that his father started. Ironic, isn't it? Although Tut wasn't really known as a very famous pharaoh at the time for anything he did during his rule, I think that was a pretty cool aspect reading about him that his main goal during his rule was to undo the religious change that his father did. He wanted to restore all the monuments that his father destroyed. He wanted to give back power to the people to decide who they wanted to worship. He really did try to undo what his father did and give some choice back to his people in that regard anyway. I'm also really curious why Tutankhamun had such a focus on doing this. Like, I wonder, did he just really disagree with what his father had done? Or, to be honest, he was only nine when he took the role of king, so realistically his advisors would have been playing a very large part in a lot of his political actions. So I wonder if did he just disagree with what his father had done, or was he, you know, kind of a puppet of his advisors until he got a bit older? Either way, I think that's an interesting thing that he did during his short reign, even though he was young and he didn't rule for long. But unfortunately, by the time he died, he didn't actually get to fully see that restoration to their original belief system the whole way through. So Tut did die very young. I still don't actually know for sure what actually killed him. There are multiple theories about what his cause of death was, but Tut did actually have a lot of health issues during the time he was alive. And it's quite unfortunate because, you know, a lot of those conditions were likely caused by the fact that his family was heavily into bread. His mother was his dad's sister was a very heavy lineage of inbreeding in his family. He was kind of a bit out of luck in that aspect and it probably did and it's unfortunate that back then they didn't know that inbreeding caused a lot of health issues because he actually continued that practice by marrying his half-sister during his reign. They had two babies. Both babies unfortunately died because of other health issues. Tut's lineage did end there and You've got to think how much of that was because of, you know, the inbreeding and the health issues that kept passing down through their line. And this wasn't just a common thing in ancient Egyptian royalty. This was very common in a lot of royal families. And the reason was because they wanted to keep the power in the family. They didn't want to have someone else marry into the family, 
have the chance of someone else that's not their family taking the throne in future. So that was their little trick to keep the throne in the family basically. It's quite gross when you compare it to how our cultures are today. We find that kind of thing quite yuck and distasteful but back then it was quite common. But it is unfortunate because it caused a lot of health problems in Tut and his children. So Tut was actually considered to be partially disabled. He had a very deformed foot. He actually had to walk with a cane. He had a degenerative bone disease called bone necrosis. And that is where your bone tissue dies due to a lack of a blood supply. And it can also lead to a lot of breaks in the bone and the eventual collapse of your bones. So a very rough condition to have. And they also found that he had several strains of malaria. If you look up the statistics on malaria, it is quite awful and a crap ton of people have died for it and are still dying from it every year. It's awful and you've got to think way back then, literally Tut lived over 3,000 years ago. What treatment would they have had for malaria back then? There's drugs now and a lot of people still die from it every year. Back then, that was rough. He had a lot of health issues going on and you add malaria into that mix, it's awful. One of the theories is that he died from a combination of having a weak immune system due to malaria and also his degenerative bone disease. And other theories were that he might have been murdered or poisoned. Personally, I think the most likely theory going around is that his mummy did have a broken leg. They think that either the day he died or the day before he died that he actually had some kind of accident. They think maybe a chariot accident where he ended up with quite a serious injury on his leg. And you've got to think back in those times, they didn't have the advanced medical care we have now. They might not have been able to treat his serious leg injury. He could have bled out. Being someone with a weak immune system to begin with, the infection of that wound could have been what killed him and it could have killed him quite quickly. So I actually do think that is probably the most likely thing that happened. That does seem to be one of the most popular theories going around that he did in fact die from a chariot accident. So fast forward to the 20th century, some 3,000 years after Tut was buried, and Tut was kind of just a footnote in history at the time. He wasn't someone who was very well known for what he'd done during his rule or anything like that. The remarkable thing about him was that his tomb had never been found. There were many tombs that had been found in the Valley of Kings where his tomb was, and a lot of other pharaohs' tombs had already been found, but his tomb had never been found. In the early 1920s, a British archaeologist Oh my god, I used too much. A British archaeologist by the name of Howard Carter was basically on a mission to find King Tut's tomb because he knew that no one else had found it and it would have been a remarkable discovery for him. Howard Carter was very devoted to trying to find King Tut's tomb and he had a financier by the name of Lord Carnarvon and he was the one who funded all of Carter's digs in the Valley of Kings. And you want to remember Carnarvon because he'll come up later, but he was mainly just the person who was funding Carter's excavations because you can imagine excavating a archaeological site in the desert was quite expensive and Howard Carter was there for many years trying to find this tomb. In 1922 Howard Carter finally had some luck. He found King Tut's tomb. And this discovery has come to be known as the greatest archaeological discovery of all time. And the reason they say that, because I was like what about all the other tombs? There's a lot of other kings in that valley. Why do they only care about Tut's? The reason they say that is because King Tut's tomb was mostly intact. You've got to imagine, right? A lot of kings were buried in Egypt and in their tombs they placed a lot of valuable items, a lot of gold, a lot of things that would be very interesting to grave robbers. It was quite easy for grave robbers to find pharaoh's tombs, especially when they were built under pyramids. So you can kind of imagine that a lot of tombs had been very heavily pillaged. And that is partly why they started to bury pharaohs in the Valley of Kings because it was a bit more out of the way and they were trying to reduce the amount of pillaging that was going on in the pharaohs tombs. And luckily that didn't really work out for them because several sources even said it was common that you know, straight after a pharaoh was buried and his tomb was sealed, straight after it, it would be robbed. So you can imagine, although they had found quite a lot of tombs, 
There were none that were as intact as King Tut's at the time. There had been a small amount of grave robbing that went on in King Tut's tomb, but it was very minimal apparently. The majority of his artifacts were still in his tomb. Not much was broken or destroyed. They actually found over 5,000 artifacts in his tomb. Basically the reason why the discovery of his tomb was so prolific was because the first authentic pharaoh's tomb that they'd found that had been so intact and in good condition and they found his perfectly preserved sarcophagus with his mummified body within it and that was a huge archaeological discovery and it was all over the media at the time and that is how King Tut became the famous King Tut. And before that point, they had barely known anything about King Tut, so you can imagine they were very excited to learn more about him. And that is where we get on to the curse of King Tut, or the curse of the pharaohs, as it is very commonly known. And talk of this curse became very popular because multiple people who had excavated his tomb ended up dying at some point. And I say at some point, because it's not like, you know, they all opened up his tomb and then, like in The Mummy, over the next couple days, they all mysteriously died in very mysterious circumstances. Because that's not what happened. It's really not. When you look into it, I'm like, hmm. I know people like to believe in, like, fun stuff like curses. Fun is probably not the right term. There were rumours going around that the curse of the fairies was killing people who had you know, gone into the tomb, opened the tomb, excavated the tomb. And the most well-known person who died after that point that they attribute to this curse was Lord Carnarvon. And if you remember, he was the financier of the whole excavation process. So they claim he died because of the curse. And I just, I just don't buy it. Because Lord Carnarvon was actually quite an ill man to begin with. He was an elderly, ill man. And the reason he became so interested in Egypt in the first place was because he lived in England and he found English winters quite harsh on his health. So during the English winter, he would travel to Egypt and he would spend his time in the warmer weather because it was better for his health. So he actually wasn't in great condition before they discovered the tomb. And it's not like he died straight away after they had opened the tomb anyway. He didn't. So some sources say he died several months after they found the tomb. Some say that he died a year after. Either way, he didn't die immediately after they opened the tomb. He actually died a fair time later from complications from a mosquito bite of all things. To me, that just sounds like bad luck and having a rather weak constitution to begin with rather than a fairy's curse, you know, because the thing you'll notice is if King Tut's out here like, cursing people for desecrating his burial site, he has a strange way of selecting what people and when to do this. <laughs> because Howard Carter, who was the British archaeologist that discovered and dug up his site to begin with, Carter excavated his site for 10 years and he was also the person who cut King Tut out of his sarcophagus. So not only did King Tut wait over 10 years for him to steal every object from his tomb, he waited 16 years to kill him. Yeah, he waited 16 years. So 16 years later, after opening King Tut's tomb, was when Howard Carter died of cancer. And I don't know about you guys, but I think if Tut is out here killing off people who you know, went into his tomb, he's pretty selective about who he's choosing. If he was punishing anyone, the main person he would go after would have been Howard Carter, the person who cut him out of his sarcophagus. Anyway, it's a load of fluff. I think it's a load of fluff. I don't think there is any curse. Of the 58 people who were present at the original excavation of King Tut's tomb, only eight of those people died in the next following 10 years. 10 years. Decade. Now, I know you might think even 8 out of 58 people is quite a few people, but you know, people die. You don't know the ages of these people, you don't know the living conditions they had, what existing health conditions they had. I don't think that means there was a curse. It's also quite selective and strange that out of 58 people, the curse would only affect a random number at different points in their life because it's not like it was, 
consistently like a month later four of them die from some strange occurrence they were all pretty random deaths and none of them seemed linked they weren't like all heart attacks or all this or that they weren't around the same time I just think it's coincidence and I know as humans we like to pattern match and we like strange things we like oddities I can see why people came up with this idea but I just don't think that it's realistic and I don't think there is a curse of any kind. So anyway, King Tut became very well known as well for the curse of the pharaohs. The media actually had a field day talking about that and actually part of the reason that the curse became so popular was because apparently Carnivan actually had an exclusivity deal with the Times newspaper. So he was selling his story to them and rival newspapers got pretty salty about that. They didn't get their slice of the cake. So apparently that was also part of it that rival newspapers were spreading this curse story because I guess they wanted their piece of the pie. They wanted something to post, not post. We're not in the current age. We're back a long time ago. They wanted something to write about, to publicize, and also, I don't know, maybe just give a, a negative connotation to the whole King Tut discovery. And I actually even saw in one article online that apparently a lot of the people who were present at the original excavation actually happened to live a longer life on average than the average age at the time. One quote I saw made me laugh because it said if the pharaoh's curse is a curse it's quite a beneficial curse. <laughs> So, I don't know, it's all how you see it, I think. If you want to link these things to something greater, you can. I think people wanted to make connections and it was popular in the media. It was a good way to sell a story. It sold a lot of stories and it was popular and it added an air of mystery to the whole archaeological discovery. Another theory that could explain why certain people got sick after entering the tomb, if you accept that premise in the first place, is that perhaps there were very old toxic pathogens in the air in those tombs. Because King Tot's tomb was closed for 3,000 years. That is a long time. And like I said earlier, they did have a tendency to put food and all kinds of things in the tombs with them to join them in the afterlife. You know, these things get moldy. There's a lot of old bacteria and stuff that could have been in there and someone with a compromised immune system could breathe that in and get very sick. I also read somewhere, not sure about the validity of this one either because I only read it in one place as well, Apparently some grave robbers claimed that when they robbed a tomb, they would open it and let it air out for like a month before going in there just to get rid of any of those toxic fumes. In any case, I don't think that's what Lord Carnarvon contracted or why he died and I don't think it was a curse. So then we move on to how the curse is referenced in modern days. In fact, today in 2020. The Curse of the Pharaohs is still very much talked about, very much discussed. And recently I have heard people saying that they think that all the craziness that has been happening in 2020 is somehow linked to the Pharaoh's curse. I was like, how is this related to 2020? If his curse was around, why did he, you know, he waited over 3,000 years just to strike us all down? Like, it's pretty petty, man. You're just chilling for 3,000 years and then you're like, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you now, 3,000 years later. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, smite you all. Anyway, so King Todd apparently waited 3,000 years to get us all. But I looked into it a little bit further, why are people saying this now, specifically? But apparently last year they actually moved his sarcophagus for the first time out of his tomb and they took it to a museum in Cairo to be restored and it has been there for quite a while now. They actually left his mummy back in the Valley of the Kings in May this year they were set to move his actual mummy to the museum as well. And I couldn't actually see any confirmation of whether this went ahead or whether it didn't. 
I don't know, I couldn't find any confirmation of that, but either way, I think people are linking the fact that he was removed from his sarcophagus, and his sarcophagus itself was removed from his tomb after thousands of years. I think that's why people are saying now that they think this is linked to what is happening now. Now, do I think this is real? No. <laughs> Put it frankly, no. And do I think this is more manufactured drama? Yes. I actually think, you know, in crazy times, like I said, humans are pattern matching. We want to find reasons for things. And 2020 has been seriously crazy. And it's been horrible for a lot of people. It has. And as humans, we want to find justifications for that. And I think it's very easy to make that connection and think maybe that is the reason we're all being like punished or something. You know, maybe that's why 2020 has been so bad. Personally, I don't buy it whatsoever. I just think 2020 has been shit and there just happens to have been a lot of bad things happening within one year. I don't think it has anything to do with the fairy's curse and I don't think the fairy's curse is a real thing. <laughs> But I do think what is unfortunate is that they have removed his sarcophagus from the tomb and they have or will be taking Tut because I did see an interview with a tour guide who lives in that area, area where the Valley of the Kings is, is called Luxor. It's quite sad for them and he seemed quite devastated because he said what's going to happen to the tourism in Luxor because people go there to see him and that is King Tut's resting place. Like. Isn't it desecrating his grave to remove him for it? Like, I don't know. I don't know how I feel either way about this because I get it. They are restoring him so they can maintain and keep that history for future generations, which is a good thing. But it's also like there's a reason why Tut was put there. That is his, his resting place. That is his home. And the people in Luxor aren't very happy about him being moved. How is that going to affect the local economy? Although I know you can say we're in COVID, it's already going to suck there, but you know, it is quite sad for the people there that, that one of their big historical elements of their area is being taken away. But yeah, overall, do I think that King Tut's curse is real? No. Do I think that he has caused all the insane shit that has been happening in 2020? No, I really don't. <laughs> Okay, so I just finished my makeup off camera because my battery is about to die soon. <laughs> so I just did my mascara, etc. Quite happy with how this look turned out. Anyway, we'll finish talking about Tut. What do you guys think about his curse or the curse of the pharaohs? Do you think this has anything to do with the craziness happening in 2020? Do you think the curse was actually connected to all the people that died after they had entered his tomb, etc. Or do you think it's people reaching for connections just because people like to make connections as humans? That's kind of what I think. I don't think there was any curse or anything. But I do think Tut's history is quite interesting either way. I do have a lot of memories of like Egyptian art growing up. My mum was really obsessed with Egypt, so she had so many books on Egypt. I've always thought Egypt was pretty interesting and cool, but I never really knew much about Tutankhamun. I do remember as a kid seeing that show Tuttenstein. I saw a crap ton of Tuttenstein. I loved that show when I was a kid. Do any of you guys remember that show? It's kind of really strange. Tut is in a museum and he comes back in the modern age from waking up in the museum as like a zombie. <laughs> Crazy show. Kid shows are so weird, aren't they? Anyway, I liked that show growing up. I think Egypt is very interesting. I'm kind of interested in doing a bit more research on like Nefertiti and looking into Cleopatra. What do you guys think about this style of video? Do you like the get ready with me concept while talking about a topic? I really like history so I'd probably do a lot of history based ones but there are like some really strange cases like true crime cases and other things like that that I would be pretty interested in talking about. So let me know if you guys do like this concept and I would be happy to do more in the future although these wouldn't be like weekly releases just because like this took a lot of research and I'm happy to do the research but I do have limited time to do that so let me know if you guys enjoyed this video and this style of video. Go check out Sydney Black's channel because I love her videos. I love all the recent ones she's done. I think she's freaking 
great. And also Bailey Sarian is great of course, but I think everyone already knows Bailey Sarian in the makeup community at least. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and that you have a nice day and I'll see you guys in the next one.